Hello, muy buenas noches. Mi nombre es Kelly Villanueva y soy asesora de Education USA en Lima, Perú. Antes de comenzar la presentación, quisiera ver si ustedes me pueden escuchar. Si me pueden escuchar, por favor, tipen. Perfecto. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Um, hoy estamos con ustedes desde Lima y desde California para brindarles mucha información que les va a ser súper útil en su proceso de postular a universidades en los Estados Unidos, en particular resaltando la importancia del examen TOEFL y BT. En la presentación de hoy vamos a tocar los siguientes temas. Voy a hablar con ustedes sobre Education USA, nuestros cinco pasos para postular a universidades americanas. Voy a resaltar la importancia de conectarse a los centros de asesoría de Education USA a nivel nacional. También voy a mencionar las redes sociales que tenemos. Y luego vamos a cambiar de español a inglés con la presentación de Lucas sobre el examen TOEFL. Y al final vamos a poder responder a cualquier duda o consulta que aún tengan sobre el examen TOEFL y BT. Entonces, antes de comenzar con la presentación, quizás muchos de ustedes por primera vez participan en un evento de Education USA. Quisiera resaltar un poco qué es Education USA y cómo te podemos ayudar. Education USA es la fuente oficial de información sobre estudios superiores en los Estados Unidos. Somos parte de una red internacional. Hay más de 400 centros en 170 países y nuestra red es auspiciada por el Departamento de Estado de los Estados Unidos. Nuestra misión como asesores y como red es proveer información completa, actual e imparcial sobre el sistema de estudios superiores en los Estados Unidos y el proceso de admisión a más de 4,000 universidades en los 50 estados de los Estados Unidos. Entonces, ¿qué tiene que ver Education USA con los cinco pasos? Nosotros en nuestros centros alrededor del mundo siempre recibimos muchas consultas sobre cómo puedo postular a una universidad americana. Por estas consultas, hemos desarrollado un plan que tiene cinco pasos. El primer paso de cualquier alumno es investigar sus opciones, asistir a una de nuestras charlas, que son mensuales y gratuitas, a venir al centro y buscar a través de ciertas plataformas las mejores universidades para su perfil y también para las universidades donde ofrecen el programa que el alumno quiere estudiar en los Estados Unidos. Uno invierte mucho tiempo en la investigación con el apoyo de un asesor y de las herramientas más útiles. El segundo paso es financiar tus estudios. Todos estamos interesados en becas. Queremos saber cómo podemos acceder a becas, poder diferenciar entre una universidad y otra, cuál es la mejor oferta para mí debido a mi perfil. Y esto también van a poder a recibir mayor apoyo asistiendo a una charla, asistiendo a una asesoría en un centro Education USA. El tercer paso quizás es el paso que requiere más a tiempo invertido. Estamos hablando de completar tu solicitud. Bueno, ustedes están hoy con nosotros, me imagino, muchos de ustedes interesados en pregrados, otros en maestrías, otros en doctorados en los Estados Unidos. Y todos ustedes van a tener que rendir el examen TOEFL IBT, el examen internacional de inglés americano para uso uh, académico. Entonces, esto es muy importante que estén hoy con nosotros para averiguar más sobre este examen y su rol. Ahora, aparte del examen TOEFL, otros exámenes internacionales que ustedes van a tener que rendir, dependiendo si son alumnos de pregrado o de posgrado, pueden incluir el examen SAT y ACT para pregrado, el GRE o el GMAT para posgrado. Si se acercan a un centro de asesoría, el asesor les va a poder indicar, dependiendo en el programa de su interés, cuáles son los exámenes que van a tener que presentar. Ahora, aparte de exámenes, es bueno resaltar que la mayoría de alumnos van a tener que presentar currículums, van a tener que presentar ensayos, cartas de recomendación de profesores, 
de supervisores, de catedráticos, van a tener que rellenar el formulario virtual y van a tener, en algunos casos, que presentar un portafolio, los postulantes de artes, o participar en una entrevista, que es lo es más común para un candidato de MBA. Entonces, eso es el paso número tres. Después de que uno postula, y las postulaciones por lo general se realizan en el mes noviembre, diciembre, enero, más o menos en el mes de marzo y abril y mayo, ustedes van a recibir los resultados de su proceso de postulación. Los alumnos que fueron admitidos, los alumnos que pudieron ganar grandes becas y pueden financiar sus estudios, van a poder acceder al paso número 4, que es solicitar su visa de estudios. De nuevo, en un centro de asesoría, nosotros te podemos ayudar a rellenar estos formularios y prepararte para una gran entrevista. El último paso es prepararse para partir. Hace dos semanas tuvimos una conferencia con Arizona State University justo sobre este tema. Yo ya tengo todos mis papeles, ya tengo mi visa, estoy listo para irme a los Estados Unidos, pero tengo muchas dudas sobre cómo es la vida académica ya, cómo puedo triunfar en una aula americana. Y nosotros en los centros de asesoría te vamos a poder dar mayores detalles y apoyo para que tengas una transición exitosa. Entonces, ahí lo tienen los cinco pasos de un proceso de postulación. Y no puedo resaltar que cuando uno tiene un asesor o acceso a un centro de asesoría, vas a poder cumplir con estos pasos y llegar un paso más cerca a tu meta de estudiar en los Estados Unidos. Ahora, nuestros centros de asesoría en el Perú, tenemos centros de asesoría en Lima, en Miraflores, en San Borja, estamos en Cusco, estamos en Chiclayo, en Hilo, en Huancayo, Arequipa, Trujillo. Um, y nosotros como asesores siempre visitamos a más provincias. Entonces, ustedes tienen que saber que para yo poder agendar una cita, tengo que identificar dónde está mi centro. Y nosotros, a través de redes sociales, te vamos a poder apoyar a guiarte y conectarte con el asesor más indicado. Al frente de ustedes tienen ahorita todas las plataformas de redes sociales que manejamos. Estamos en Facebook, en Education USA Perú, en Twitter, en Instagram y ahora en YouTube, donde vamos a colgar todos estos videos de webinars que tenemos con los representantes más importantes de universidades, y de los exámenes internacionales que ustedes van a tener que realizar a lo largo de su proceso de postulación. Entonces, les pido, por favor, que nos sigan para siempre mantenerse informados de qué más tengo que hacer y quién me puede ayudar. Entonces, con esto, yo estoy concluyendo mi parte en español. Ahora quisiera hablarles un poco sobre la persona, Lucas Fink, que nos va a ahora apoyar en explicar cómo prepararnos para el TOEFL IBT. La parte de Lucas va a ser en inglés y por lo tanto voy a leer su biografía que también la tengo en inglés. Lucas is the teacher behind Magush TOEFL. Lucas has been teaching TOEFL preparation and more general English courses since 2009 and he has helped thousands of students improve their TOEFL scores through Magush lessons and practice material. Quisiera resaltar que nosotros, al considerar a quién podíamos entrevistar el día de hoy, elegimos a alguien que ha invertido muchos años de su vida en trabajar con alumnos internacionales justo en el tema de mejorar su inglés para dar un buen examen TOEFL. Entonces, les pido, por favor, que pongan mucha atención a lo que tiene que decir Lucas. Resalto que él va a presentar en inglés porque el examen TOEFL es para un nivel intermedio alto avanzado de inglés y cualquier consulta que tengan, por favor coloquen sus dudas en el chat box. Nosotros, Alejandro y yo, vamos a estar muy atentos de sus consultas para al final de la presentación poder um, ayudarte a resolver tus dudas o enviarte mayor información por correo electrónico. Entonces, con eso, muchísimas gracias y voy a pasar el micrófono a Lucas Fink. Lucas. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, can you hear me? Perfect. So I will mute my microphone and Lucas, it's all you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Let me know if my volume is too loud or too quiet. 
All right, so as Kelly said, my name is Lucas, and I am the teacher behind Magoosh TOEFL. Uh, Magoosh is a test preparation company that does online test preparation, and specifically, I help with the TOEFL. Um, I conduct the TOEFL lessons and uh, wrote and edited many of our TOEFL practice questions. So today, now, I'm going to walk you through a general overview of the TOEFL, um, what is on the test, how you should study for the test, uh, what resources you can use, and a little bit more. And after we finish, we will have some time to answer questions if you have any. Okay, so first let's start with the name TOEFL. The TOEFL is the test of English as a foreign language. And more specifically, today, now, we're talking about the TOEFL IBT. IBT stands for Internet-Based Test. So it is one version of the TOEFL, because there is also a PBT, which is the Paper-Based Test. So IBT is going to be on the computer, and the PBT is on paper. It's not just that, though. There are actually different tests. Uh, the IBT is available in almost all countries, including Peru. It is the main test. I think 98% of TOEFL takers take the IBT. So that's why I'm talking about the IBT today. It is the more important test. Um, otherwise, though, the PBT, the paper-based test, is offered in some countries that have less internet access. Uh, Suriname, for example, I think still takes the PBT, but soon there will be no more PBT. It will only be IBT. And for you, probably you're going to take the IBT if you take the TOEFL. Okay. Uh, I do want to point out that the PBT is a very different test, so anything that I say about the IBT uh, might not apply for the PBT. There are different types of questions, etc. And as uh, Kelly said, in Peru, it is just the IBT. So what is on the TOEFL? There are two main types of skills that the TOEFL tests. The first one might surprise you is academic skills. In other words, if you are very fluent in English in conversation from speaking with friends, that might not help you completely on the TOEFL because you need some uh, academic skills like you use in a college or a university or a school. For example, note-taking, summarizing, organizing information in an essay. These are things that you might not do in uh, informal conversation or informal English. You do it more if you're in a school, right? Uh, beyond that, of course, there are some general language skills that you need. You need proper vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, and all that. But that's all in practice. It is not uh, quizzed. So you don't, for example, get um, grammar questions that ask you to change the verb to the correct form. No, no, no. You write, you listen, you speak, um, you read. They're all uh, in practice, not actually isolated to just grammar or just vocabulary. So that's what's not on the TOEFL. You don't get those grammar exercises. Um, another thing you don't get, logic-based questions. So on the SAT or the GRE, there will be questions that are about what you can logically understand. You might need to analyze an argument. That's not on the TOEFL. On the TOEFL, it is only about understanding the direct information. If you understand the information, if you understand the language, then you can answer correctly. There are no logical tricks or traps. And what's more, this is interesting, there's no personal interaction on the TOEFL. You never talk to a person in English. You never listen to a human being speaking in English. It's all on the computer. I'll talk more about that in the speaking, listening, writing sections in a little bit. But just know that this is all done with a computer by yourself. That is different from the IELTS, 
on the IELTS, you will actually speak with a human being in the speaking part of the test. What else is not on the TOEFL? Authentic material, meaning everything that is on the TOEFL was created for the TOEFL. Everything you listen to is recordings of actors. They're not uh, recordings of real professors. Everything that you read has been edited specifically to be the right level of language, the right length, the right topics for the TOEFL. So it's a little bit different than English in day-to-day -day life. The English on the TOEFL is a little bit specific to the task. Let's talk about what parts of the test there are. Let's break it down to the sections. The first section is reading, then listening, and you get a 10-minute break. That's about two hours into the test, a little bit more. Then it's speaking, and then writing. So. Those are the four English skills, right? That's doing uh, everything that you can do using English. So there's one section for each main skill. Uh, in, within those sections, there will be an experimental part that is um, not graded. So what I mean by this, for example, in the reading section, you will read three texts, and you will answer questions about those three texts. It's possible that you will actually get four texts. And that fourth one will be experimental. It will not be graded. It will be used for ETS, the company who makes the TOEFL, to understand the difficulty of the test as a whole. But you will not know which text is experimental. So you have to try your best on every text. Even if there are four and one is not graded, you can't skip or ignore one text. You have to answer them all as best as possible. Let's go into a little bit more detail. Uh, first with the scoring, the TOEFL is scored from 0 to 120. This is a little strange. It's not percentage, right? It's not 0 to 100. Um, it is on a scale that comes from a special type of um, calculation of scores. Uh, you start with a raw score in each section. Say you can get 45 points in the reading section. And then that is scaled to the 0 to 30 scale. This is so each test can be compared to other versions, right? Because if you take the TOEFL on Tuesday, and then you take, well, it's usually Saturdays or Fridays. Uh, if you take the TOEFL on Saturday in September, and then you take it again in October, you're not going to get the same questions, right? You're going to get two different sets of questions, two different versions of the TOEFL. So you need to have a way to compare scores from those two tests. If you get, for example, 43 raw points in the reading in September and 41 raw points in the reading in October, those might scale to be the same. Maybe they both scale to be 25 points on the reading or 28 points on the reading. Because sometimes the reading sections of different tests are a little bit different in difficulty. Now, that's a pretty complicated system of scaling. So you don't have to worry too much about the raw points. Just know that your score is not how many questions you got right. It goes through this scaling process and becomes the 0 to 30 scale. Schools, uh, what you need to get on the TOEFL, it depends. Uh, there are very many different requirements at different schools, at different universities. Some schools require 80, some schools require 90, some 100. So it's really important that you find out what are the requirements at the university or college or whatever program that you are interested in. 
because maybe you only need a 70 on the TOEFL. Maybe you need 90. And your target score, your goal, will depend on what those requirements are. So research the specific schools that you are interested in and find their requirements. Most commonly, though, it's 80, 90, or 100. So it is very important that you check. Sometimes you will get conditional acceptance. So it's possible, for example, if a university requires 80 on the TOEFL and you get a 70, it's possible at some universities, some colleges, that you can be accepted with the 70 if you take an extra English class or you take the TOEFL again in three months or six months and score that, uh, the required score. So they might have some conditions that you need to be accepted. Uh, again, though, this is only at some universities. Not all schools uh, give conditional acceptance. So it's important to research what is possible at the programs that you are going to apply to. The reading section of the TOEFL. Let's talk about this. It is the first section of the test. And basically, it looks a little bit like this. You will have a text on the side, and you will have questions on the left. And those questions will refer to specific paragraphs in the text. So there will be, on each text, a uh, set of 12 to 14 questions. And there are three to four of these, as I mentioned earlier. And you'll get 20 minutes for each of those sets of questions, and including reading the text. So for example, if you have a TOEFL with three texts, that means you're going to get 60 minutes to do the full reading section. It's not divided. So you'll get 60 minutes at the beginning. And if you spend 40 minutes on the first text, well, that's a problem because that means you only have 20 minutes for the next two texts. So you need to watch the clock while you're reading and answering questions. And be sure that you stay at the correct pace so that you can finish in time. It's very important to get the timing for the reading section. It's one of the most common problems. It's all or almost all multiple choice. Um, so it's A, B, C, or D. There are four choices for most TOEFL reading questions. There are some questions, uh, specifically the final question on each text, that are a little bit longer and more com complicated, but it's mostly multiple choice, asking you about the details, the vocabulary, the meaning of the text. So you really need to do a lot of um, using synonyms, a lot of rephrasing to get these questions correct. Because like I said earlier, this is not about logic. It's about understanding the language, mostly. So if the text uses one word, the correct answer choice might use a different word, a synonym, that means the same thing. And that, if you don't know the synonym, can be confusing. But if you know the meanings of the synonyms and the rephrasing, then it should be relatively easy to find the correct answer. Now, there are some very common problems here. The clock especially causes a problem, as I mentioned, because if you're not timing it well, you can reach, for example, the last five minutes of your reading section and have 14 more questions to answer. And that means you're not going to answer them all correctly. So how can you fix that? One strategy that really helps is to try answering the questions while you read. Usually, students read the whole text first, and then they go to question one and answer question one. Another way, what I am suggesting now, is to Skip the text. Go past the text. Go straight to answer, or sorry, question one. Read question one, and then go to the text. 
Find the answer to question one, answer it, and continue. So in this way, you are answering the questions while you read. It means that you read a little bit slower, but it also means that you do less rereading. This strategy doesn't work for every student. I advise trying it in practice. If it helps you, that's great. If it only confuses you, then maybe it's not right for you. You might still need to read the text before the first question. That's OK. Another common problem is focus. Because these texts are academic, they are about things like geography or evolution or some environmental studies or some history or sometimes business. They're not always interesting. You might not be interested in what you read, and that's OK, but it can be difficult to focus. If that's the case, I really recommend summarizing the paragraphs as you read. So for example, if you have five paragraphs or six paragraphs, and you're answering question one, well, that question is going to be answered in the first paragraph. So first, read question one. Then go to the first paragraph, read it, find the answer to question one. And when you find it, when you stop reading, think, what did I just read? And try to summarize what you read in a short sentence. This helps you stay focused on the bigger picture, on the big ideas in the text, the most important information. And being interactive with the passage helps you to focus a little bit more rather than reading the whole thing and uh, just being passive during that. The more active you are, the more you think about what you are reading and try to summarize, the easier it is to stay focused. The next section is the listening section. And this is a similar length to the reading section. It is altogether 60 minutes or 90 minutes. The reading section, as I mentioned, was 60 minutes or 80 minutes. And you get six or nine recordings. So that means you have roughly 10 minutes per recording and set of questions, right? Those recordings are going to be lectures and conversations. You'll have either four or, um, four or six lectures, and you'll have either two or three conversations, depending on whether you have six or nine. And again, this depends on whether you have an experimental listening section, which is not graded, but you can't identify. So those lectures and conversations, as I mentioned, they are actors. After you hear them, you will hear them only once. After you hear them, you will get questions. So you'll get, for example, a lecture that takes five minutes to listen to. And when that lecture finishes, you see a multiple choice question about what you heard. You have no control. You cannot go back and listen again. You'll get multiple choice questions about the details that you heard. And in doing this, when you're answering the listening questions on the, on the uh, TOEFL, a lot of students have trouble with focusing on the uh, lecture or the conversation that they listen to. And this causes a very big problem because imagine you don't hear 10 seconds or 15 seconds of a lecture because you're not paying attention, because you're not focusing. Well, if there is a question, a multiple choice question, about that part that you didn't hear, you can't listen again. You can't answer the question. You lose points. So staying focused is extremely important, and it does cause a lot of problems. The most important thing to do for this is to take notes. This is very similar to the summarizing in the reading section. You want to um, take. You want to write down what you hear while you listen. But sometimes that causes another problem. Many students take too many notes. If you try to write everything, then you will fail at taking good notes. You will have a problem. You can't write everything because they speak faster than you can write. I guarantee. 
So that means you need to really choose what you write down. The best way to do this is to take structural notes. This is, again, similar to summarizing in the reading section. You want to try to find the big ideas and the structure of the lecture. So say, for example, a professor might introduce a new topic, and then he will define the topic. And then he'll give an example of how it happened. And then he'll give an example of problems. Sorry. And in each of those, when you hear a new example, you hear a new definition, you want to find that and write it in your notes as part of the big structure. This takes practice. It takes practice and seeing other people's uh, perfectly structured notes. The more you see the ideal notes and the more you do the practice yourself taking those notes, the easier it becomes to find the structure in a total listening. They are very standard. They're very standardized because they are written and acted in the same way in, by the same writers and the same actors for every test. So you start to hear patterns. You start to hear how those uh, lectures are created, and it becomes a little bit easier to take the structural notes to find the most important parts. Next, the speaking section is after the break, so you get a 10-minute break first. At this point, it's about two hours into your exam. And then the speaking section is the shortest section, but it's also one of the most interesting ones. The speaking section is made of six tasks, and you're going to answer all of these into a microphone. You're going to be looking at your computer screen in a room with many other people all doing the same thing at the same time. So it's kind of a strange experience. So those six tasks are first and second about your thoughts and experience. We call these the independent tasks. They're only about your speech. Later tasks include reading and listening. So in task four, you read a, a short academic passage, very short, and then you listen to a conversation. Similarly, in task four, you read and then you listen to a lecture. And in those tasks, you need to summarize what you read and heard. So it's not just about your speaking ability. You need to be able to read and listen in order to get these correct, in order to get the highest scores. Because if you miss information in the uh, listening, then you won't be able to summarize completely. completely in your answer. So again, focus is very important here. And notes are important once again. And again, you cannot listen a second time. You can only listen once. Tasks five and six are only listening. There's no text to read. You just listen to a conversation and then summarize and give your opinion. And in task six, you listen to a lecture and summarize it. So there's a lot of summarizing here. It's very important for the total. Some common problems. Well, I mentioned that um, there's a lot of people doing the same thing at the same time, right? When you're taking the test, you might be in a room with 20, 30 other people also answering the speaking tasks while you are answering them. If you are listening to your neighbor, it's difficult to focus on your answer. That's a very common, very large problem. One way to help this is to focus on outlines, the notes that you took while you listened or the notes that you took before you uh, started the recording of your answer. Those can help you stay focused. If you're looking at your words, your notes on your paper, then you uh, will listen less to your neighbor next to you and see more of your own ideas. But to be honest, there's no perfect solution to this. I have many other small pieces of advice. I won't talk about them all here. But say, for example, putting your ears over your headphones. Um, or in some cases, students like to close their eyes while they speak. Uh, there are a lot of small tips, but most importantly, it helps to get practice. 
there's nothing better than being practiced because that makes you feel more comfortable. If you feel more comfortable, then you will be less distracted. Not knowing the format causes a big problem here too, and practice, again, really helps. So not knowing the format. For example, task five. In task five, you first read, and then you listen to a conversation. And then when you give your answer, you need to do a few things. You need to summarize, or sorry, in task five, you don't read. You only listen to a conversation. But in your answer, you need to do a few things. You need to summarize the problem that the two people in the conversation mentioned. You need to summarize the two solutions that the people in the conversation talked about. And then you need to choose one of those solutions and say why you think it is the better solution. If you know this before you start, if you know this before you answer the question, it's a lot easier to answer the question fully in the time that they give you. If you don't know it, many students will summarize the problem and summarize the two solutions and then not have enough time to give their opinion and they lose points on task five. So knowing the format and practicing giving those structured answers based on um, a TOEFL-like questions can really help in learning the format and learning the timing. The writing section is the final section of the test, and it is made of two parts, two essays. You'll read and listen and summarize for the first essay, kind of similar to the speaking tasks, uh, tasks three and four. And in this case, you're going to write your summary, and you'll have 20 minutes to write it. In the second essay, you write about your opinion or your personal experiences. This essay is longer and it's a little bit more free form. And again, for the first essay, if you don't remember what you heard, that causes problems. Uh, so notes are very important for the writing section too, and it's important to practice taking those notes. The most common problems for the writing section are first, Repeating the text, this is one of the saddest, most problematic uh, mistakes that students make. If you just copy what you read in the same wording, the people who grade the essay will notice and you will lose points because they will assume that you are not capable, you are not skilled enough in English to summarize using your words. So do not copy the text exactly. You need to use different wording, using synonyms, paraphrasing what you read. If it's just one word that's copied, repeated, that's usually fine. If it's a string of three words or four words all next to each other, that's going to be a problem. So do not copy from the passage. That's the best advice I can give there. Use your own wording. Another common problem is variety. By this, I mean short sentences, long sentences, different types of sentences. If all of your sentences start with, the professor says, the professor says, the professor says, that's going to be a problem. You want to have different types of sentence structures using long and short structures with different introduction phrases, different transitions between sentences uh, with variety. That shows that you're capable of using different types of English structures uh, and you're not at a low level using the same simple structure again and again. Now, that we've talked about the uh, format of the test and what you actually do during your TOEFL. Let's talk about the registration. How do you actually register for the test? Well, first of all, you do need to pay money. It is expensive. Uh, in internationally, the TOEFL is $250. In Peru, it is $200. Uh, you pay by credit card. It is an expensive test, yes. So. Ideally, right, you don't want to take it 
uh, several times. Ideally, you want to take it only once. That's why preparing for the TOEFL is so important. If you're not prepared, if you have trouble with the speaking section because you don't know what to expect, and you get a low score when you could get a higher score, it's a waste of money, right? So in order to save money, it really helps to know the test well before you take it. And for uh, your sending your score reports, there's two ways you can send score reports. First, you can uh, choose the schools to send to before you take the test. And you get four schools for free that way. You can choose four schools and send your scores for free. But if you do that, you don't know what score you're sending, and you can't change it. So if you do this, it's free, but it's a little bit risky. You can also uh, send scores after you take the test. You can choose which schools that you send to after you get your scores. But in order to do that, it costs $19 for each school that you send to. You can, however, choose which test, if you take it more than once, goes to which school. So say, for example, you take the test once in October and once in November. And then in December, you send scores. This is not usually the timeline for applying to schools, but just imagine. Now, in December, you have two tests, right? You have the October test and you have the November test. And you can choose in December which scores you send. So you can choose to send the October test scores if those are higher, for example. If you choose the schools to send to before you take the test, then you have no control. You can't choose with what scores get sent. They will get sent because you already chose. So that's um, registering for the test. That's actually more about how the scores get sent. Uh, the registration all happens on the official ETS website. Uh, so if you go to ETS.com, I believe .org, sorry, ETS.org, you can find the registration process there. Studying for the TOEFL. Okay, there are actually a couple ways you can study for the test. One way is to simply learn the test structure. As I mentioned, it's a very specific kind of test, and there are very specific types of questions, like that speaking question. If you know what you will see, then you will get a higher score. And just to make this perfectly clear, imagine a native speaker who has never seen the TOEFL before, who knows nothing about the test. But they're native. They grew up in America. They grew up speaking English their whole life. They are well educated. They have read a lot of books. They're, you know, they, they can speak, write, read perfectly well. And if they take the TOEFL, they might not get a perfect score. In fact, if you search, if you Google um, native speakers taking the TOEFL, you'll find that native speakers sometimes take the test and get 105 or 110 out of 120. Why does that happen? Because they don't know what to expect. If you know what to expect and you know how to best answer the questions before you take the test, you can get a higher score. This usually takes about a month to learn how to take the test. This is the smaller amount of improvement that you can get. Because if you're going to spend more time really learning the skills that you need, not just the format of the test, but, for example, skills like taking notes, skills like summarizing, if you focus on those uh, academic skills, you can see larger improvement, but that takes a little bit longer. And finally, there's the more general English improvement, you know, vocabulary, grammar, learning to speak with better pronunciation, to speak more fluently, more quickly, without trouble, without pauses. This takes a lot of time. And depending on how much you want to improve, it can take years. I've had students who have studied for two years for the TOEFL 
focusing mostly on general English improvement in order to get up to the 80 or 90 score that they need uh, from a lower score from a 60 or a 50. If you're looking for a score improvement over 10 or 15 points, then you're probably going to need this general English improvement, which means using English as much as possible in your daily life. If you are um, studying for the TOEFL, you can, of course, study by learning the test, as I said, learning how to take the test, learning what types of questions you will see and the best strategies for answering those questions. But it also helps to get that uh, general English practice, no matter what, even if you're studying for only one month, it helps to include that general English practice. That means listening, speaking, writing, and reading English as much as possible. And using non-test, uh, non non-topo specific material can help. Especially, it can help you be more interested because Sometimes students aren't so interested in actually taking the test, but they might be interested in reading in English if they choose what they read, right? So here are some suggestions for getting non-exam practice. First and foremost, read as much as possible. I say that because reading helps with your grammar and your vocabulary, and then that helps with all the other sections. So reading a lot can help your speaking, it can help your listening, it can help your writing. It is the best way to get natural vocabulary improvement and natural grammar improvement because you can spend more time looking at the exact words and seeing the structures and trying to understand the structures. When you're listening, sometimes it's hard to learn the new grammar or learn new vocabulary because it goes very fast. Reading, you can go as slowly as you need to, and you can make these sort of natural improvements by uh, seeing real English, native English used. So I really recommend reading as much as possible. Read every day in English if you can. Read native English, too. Um, academic material and news is best for improving for the TOEFL because the TOEFL is an academic test. So textbooks, things that you would read in college or in high school in the university, in English, is those are great. Um, as I said, of course, TOEFL passages, TOEFL texts are the ideal. But if you can't get that and you're not interested in the academic material or you don't have access to textbooks, uh, academic textbooks, then news is a great resource. Um, news sources like The New Yorker, New York Times. They're very difficult, but they are helpful for getting the more advanced grammar and the more advanced vocabulary that you will need for the TOEFL because it is an advanced test of high level English. And um, specifically, if you can use science news, that's great. Um, any news that's about, you know, Natural sciences is going to be most relevant for the TOEFL because you do see natural science passages and lectures on the test. Okay, and if you're trying to get some listening practice, well, there are a few resources. My favorite is TED.com, TED.com. Listening to TED lectures can be great practice for the TOEFL, but make sure you're listening to a native English speaker. They should be American or British or Australian. If the person you're listening to is, say, Indian or Chinese, then it won't help as much with pronunciation. Listening to native speakers and imitating the native speakers that you hear is a great way to improve your pronunciation. So use the native lectures on TED.com. If you have trouble following, if you have trouble understanding some of the things you listen to on TED, then there are almost always subtitles so you can read while you listen. That's a great way to follow and learn new vocabulary and learn new grammar while you listen. Podcasts. Uh, NPR podcasts, for example, uh, can be another great way to listen to something that's a little academic, a little scientific or historical, or something that's related to those academic topics you see on the TOEFL, 
but also enjoy it while you listen. Listen as much as possible. Listen on the train, in the car, while you're walking. Yeah, This is a way that you can practice your English without sitting down and using TOEFL material, without sitting down and studying in a classroom. The more you listen, the better. If you need to listen on slow, that's okay. If you need to listen two times, three times, great, that's okay. I also recommend actually listening three times, once without text, once with subtitles, and once by stopping and repeating and imitating what you heard. That third time, that imitation really helps your pronunciation a lot, especially if you know exactly what they said because you already heard it and read it in your previous times. So TED is very good for that because it does have those subtitles for most lectures. All right, so uh, after you read and after you listen, it's always helpful to summarize what you read and what you heard. If you do this in your head, fine. If you are alone, even better, speak out loud. Speak to yourself and summarize what you heard or read. If you want to practice your writing, then write what you heard and read. Like I said, summarizing is very important for the TOEFL. It's in all sections of the test. You need to summarize in the reading, listening, speaking, and writing sections. So uh, learning to summarize uh, succinctly uh, in a short amount of time is extremely helpful. This is a way that you can uh, use non-TOEFL practice, you know, um, an article from the New Yorker, for example, or from some other newspaper, and make it into TOEFL-like practice. If you don't want to summarize, another thing you can do is respond with your opinion. So sometimes it's a little boring just repeating what you heard or what you read. Instead, you might want to write or speak out loud what you think about what you heard or listened to. This is helpful uh, not as much for the TOEFL as summarizing, but it is helpful for just getting that extra speaking or writing practice and being interested and engaged in what you heard or read. Some resources for actual TOEFL practice, the official resources, the official material is best. You cannot get better practice questions than what is created by ETS, the company that makes the TOEFL. They have the best practice. You can find some free material on their website, ets.org slash TOEFL slash IBT. And there you can find, I think, three different resources that give you practice questions. But if that is not enough, if you need more than the free material, the official guide is helpful. There are three practice tests here. It also has a few hundred pages of description of the test, um, exactly what you will see on what part of the test. And these books, the official TOEFL IBT test books, uh, each have five tests in them. There are two volumes. So there's volume one with five tests and volume two with five other different tests. And for all these official books, for all three official books, there is a CD that you can use to take the practice tests on your computer and mimic pretty closely the actual test that you'll take um, in the test center when you pay for the real TOEFL. So that CD is super helpful. Getting online computer experience with the test is much better than taking it in a book because the real test is on a computer. All right, so for some other resources, Magoosh, my company, has some other free material you can use. We have a blog. This is super helpful. We have posts almost every day with new, um, new posts about you know, how to take the TOEFL, what you'll see on the test, all sorts of different topics related to the TOEFL. We have flashcards. These have the 600 most important words for the TOEFL, academic vocabulary that you might not know. 
you can download those flashcards for free, either uh, on an iPhone or on Android, or you can use them on your computer if you go to tofu.magoosh.com slash flashcards. And YouTube, that's me. I'm Lucas, and I do the TOEFL YouTube uh, videos for Magoosh. So every two weeks, we have a new video that discusses something like, for example, what's a good TOEFL score, or how do you answer a reading detail question, or some other strategy or tip or advice or vocabulary that's helpful. There are more unofficial books that I can recommend, some of my favorites. The Complete Guide, this is similar in the quality of the questions to real TOEFL material from ETS. It has a lot of practice. Um, unfortunately, the answers to those practice questions are in a separate book. There's also the Cambridge Preparation. The uh, practice questions in Cambridge Preparation aren't as similar to real questions as the questions in the complete guide, but they're still pretty good. And more importantly, it has a lot of skill building practice. For example, note taking practice or summarizing practice or transitioning from one idea to another idea. These skills that are important for the test uh, are really broken down into part by part building uh, skill building uh, exercises in Cambridge. But again, their practice questions are not perfect. There's a lot of reading that's too difficult, a lot of listening that just doesn't sound like the official material. So it's not perfect. Neither of these books are perfect, to be honest, but they are my favorite books, even so. And of course, there's a lot more on our blog. I have reviews for many more books. If you visit uh, magoosh.com slash TOEFL, you can find other book reviews for other unofficial and official TOEFL books. And that's all for me for now. But if you have questions for me, I'm here for a bit longer. I would love to answer any questions you have. I saw a few questions already in the comment box. Uh, but preferably, please write your questions in English if possible. I do not answer, or I do not speak Spanish particularly well. So um, I have. Let's see. Let's go back to a question from first from Alonzo. Alonzo asked uh, how to improve grammar skills. Uh, there's really two ways that you can improve grammar. There's grammar in practice and grammar by studying the rules, right? And of course, most of you, I'm sure, have studied the rules before. That only really helps part of the way. As I mentioned earlier, reading is super important. I think that's my number one piece of advice. If you're reading every day, you will learn the natural patterns of English through experience. So let's say, for example, um, a question form. If you're asking a question, you want to change the way the verb happens, and you're going to move part of the verb to the beginning. And you say, uh, should I go to the store instead of I should go to the store, right? And let's say, imagine you often make the mistake and you say, I should go to the store when you ask a question. But that's incorrect. Well, if you're reading often enough and you see should I, should I, should I, should I, then after you see it enough times, it will be natural for you to imitate that. So reading as much as possible and imitating what you hear and what you read is a great way to learn correct grammar. The students I have had with the most natural, the most correct grammar are the ones who have English speaking friends who they talk with all the time, English speaking friends who they email with or text message with. Uh, that can really help you to follow the same patterns that natives use. I recommend doing that in addition to focused uh, practice of specific grammar points in, you know, in English textbooks, in English learning material. 
but usually I find that students do too much of the uh, filling in the blanks or changing the form of the verb types of school exercises and not enough of the practice. Speaking, reading, writing, that as much as possible is actually the best way to get real grammar improvement. Alejandro asked how to improve speaking skills. There are a number of different parts of speaking skills. Um, the first one is, well, it is thinking of the words that you want to say fast enough to say them in time and not pause. If you're trying to just speak fluidly and not stop like that, Again, the most important part is just practice. It is speaking with people. I highly recommend finding a language partner, if possible, so who you can talk with in English. Now, that might sound like very obvious advice. It is obvious advice, but it's the most important one. Some other things for speaking skills, imitating. I mentioned before um, listening three times, and on the third time, Stopping to repeat what you said and imitate what you said, uh, what you heard. That's really helpful for pronunciation. You want to sound like a native speaker. If you have a Spanish accent or a Portuguese accent, that can cause problems when you're talking with a native speaker. And the best way that I find to get rid of an accent is to imitate. So you want to hear and then repeat in the exact same voice that you heard. It will feel unnatural. It will feel wrong. It will feel like you are um, mocking or insulting the person that you listened to. It will sound strange and feel strange, but that's okay. It should feel strange because what feels natural is your accent. What feels natural is your native language, and you do not want that natural sound. You want the um, English sound, which will be unnatural, and that's okay. So imitation is also key. And for the TOEFL in particular, speaking is about timing and structuring your answers. For the TOEFL, you want to know exactly what you will say before you start speaking and how you will structure. So that means writing down an outline which shows what you're going to say. If you only have, uh, for example, the first and second task 15 seconds to write an outline, that can be difficult. So it's important to practice writing very, very short outlines first and learning how to structure. That's one thing that Magush Tofel helps with. That's part of our preparation for the test. You also find practice for that in books like Cambridge. Okay, let's find the next question here. I hope that helps, Alejandro. Uh, the next question I see in English. How to improve drafting skills for the writing section? <laughs> These, these general questions, I'm afraid, get pretty general answers. Um, how do you improve Drafting for the writing section. Um, uh, number one is taking notes. Number two is uh, being able to, uh, by, by taking notes, I mean during the listening on the TOEFL, taking notes while you hear it. Uh, number two is structuring, um, following the structure of you know introduction, uh, example one, example two, example three, and uh, structuring your notes as much as possible like that. Uh, you won't actually have an opportunity to write a, uh, a first draft and then do serious edits and have a second draft. You only have a short time, so you're going to need to write one draft and then do fast edits on your actual TOEFL. Um, but you do want to prepare just by writing the big ideas first. What is the first example? What is the second example? It's important to stay uh, quite general when you create your outline. Um, or for the ind independent essay, you're going to write about your opinions. And again, it's important to stay general 
uh, and not write too much for your notes, but to have ideas for each part. You want to have ideas for your first paragraph, ideas for your second paragraph, etc. Uh, you can see more of that um, in some examples in, uh, in Magusha's practice material, also in official books and in those unofficial books in particular, um, and again, more on those. How long do you have to wait for the results? Oh, yes, um, someone at Education USA already answered that. Uh, roughly 20 days or less, that's true. Uh, in most cases, it is only 10 days to wait for results. Uh, most of our students get their results on the 10th day. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. It could take up to 20 days, but usually 10. Thank you for answering that, I think, Kelly. Uh, a web page from Ramsey's, a, re a web page in which I can practice my speaking with native speakers. Yeah, absolutely. There are a few. Um, one of the most popular ones is italki. Um, I will write that in the chat here, but italki.com um, is the most popular, I believe, um, uh, English and language exchange site. Uh, let's see, there's also, there are a few, if I can remember names. Um, yeah, My Language Exchange is another. Um, that's uh, mylanguageexchange.com um, can offer the same thing as Itachi, that is uh, some language partner who you can talk with. Often these require uh, some amount of payment, uh, but sometimes you can get free language exchange, which is great if you can get it. Um, we have, yeah, okay, we have another question here. Uh, from Education USA, the uh, big difference between the TOEFL and the IELTS. Um, the biggest difference between TOEFL and IELTS is probably the speaking section because you speak to a computer on the TOEFL, but you speak to an actual person for IELTS. Uh, universities don't necessarily prefer one or the other, but some universities only accept the TOEFL. So if you're choosing between uh, the TOEFL and the IELTS, first step is find out what is accepted by the university that you want to apply to. If they only accept the TOEFL, well, then that's the answer to the question. Only take the TOEFL. If they accept either the TOEFL or the IELTS, then you can choose based on what you prefer. Again, the biggest difference is the speaking section. Um, but there are some other differences, for example, in writing your essay on the TOEFL, you write on a computer, IELTS, you write by hand. Um, so there are a number of also different kinds of questions that you answer. Some of the material in the IELTS feels easier, so it can help with confidence, but the truth is that it's not like one is easier than the other. If you get a 95 on the TOEFL, then you will probably get a 7 on the IELTS, and the university that you're applying to might have a requirement of a 95 or a 7. Um, so people who score high on the TOEFL also score high on the IELTS, generally. It's not like uh, you, there is one easy test that you will get a perfect score on. Very, very few people get a perfect score on either the TOEFL or the IELTS. It's a very wide range of scores, and um, they do correspond to each other in a way so that if you take the TOEFL and get one score, you would likely get a similar score on the IELTS and be uh, admitted by similar universities, or rather meet similar requirements for universities. So there's not like one easier test. Um, how many times can you take the TOEFL? You can take it as many times as you want, but it costs money every time. Uh, scores are valid for uh, two years after taking the test, so you can take it and take it and take it, but uh, if you wait too long after you take the exam, then the universities will not accept the old scores anymore. 
Uh, you can always send scores from any specific exam that you took. Again, you have to pay $19 for each score that you send to each university. But you can choose those old scores as long as they are still valid before the two years are finished. Uh, you can send those old scores on. The third question here from, um, from Education USA is frequently asked questions. Number three, what English level should I have before I consider signing up for the TOEFL? Uh, it depends on your goal, but you don't want basic English. You want intermediate or more. The TOEFL is an advanced test. The highest levels of TOEFL scores are basically native. If you get a 118 or 119 on the TOEFL, you're almost native. You are fluent in English. Um, if you're, on the other hand, school or university only requires a 60, then having intermediate English skills is enough. Um, it's not only a test for advanced speakers, it can be a test for intermediate speakers if that is what is required. So it depends on the university's requirements. Um, if you are a very low level English speaker, uh, elementary basic learning uh, for only a few years and you have trouble understanding, for example, me, native speakers uh, at all, then the TOEFL is not for you, probably. Uh, let's see. Uh, so the question from Elmer Zacharias Ugarte. Uh, the English, rec uh, English inst institutions in Peru, I cannot actually recommend those. Maybe Education USA has some recommendations there, but I, uh, I am based in California in the USA. Um, yes, Renzo, intermediate level can be enough depending on your uh, goals. All right, it looks like we are almost finished. One last question, final question from Alonzo. How can you get the most of flashcard studying? Repeat the flashcards often, read as much as possible, and use the words you learn. So you need to see the words many times in flashcards. You need to see them used in actual English. The best way to do that is by reading a lot and then using them in your speech, in your writing, in your answers. Um, that also helps to remember the words that you learned. If you use them, then you, uh, you remember them better. If you don't use them, you will forget them. OK, I hope all that helps. If you want more help, um, tofu.magush.com. We have a premium product there, which uh, will prepare you completely for the test, explain strategy on how to answer every kind of question. You can email us if you have any other questions at help at magoosh.com. And again, our blog has lots of free material, uh, free posts that you can use to learn a little bit more about the test. And a quick question from Julia Torres. Um, Possibly. It's hard to say. Uh, that's only listening. There's reading, there's writing, there's speaking, there's a lot more. And it depends on what your target score is, Julio. If it's 60, that's very different from a target score of 100. All right. So that's Great. all for me now. I'll give it back to Kelly. Thank you all for listening today. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much, Lucas. I, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, this was a fantastic presentation, as always, incredibly thorough. Um, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, Alejandro and myself and the Education USA Center here in Lima were able to um, collect a lot of the links that Lucas mentioned today. So please feel free to come back to this webinar, and the links will be here at least for the rest of the week. We have recorded all of the presentation. So if you joined us um, a little bit late, there's no problem. We have it all recorded, and we will share it on our Education USA YouTube. And Lucas will also share this with you. And nothing, I mean, I think a lot of you are here because you know that the TOEFL is a very important exam for applying to US universities. 
And as Education USA advisors, we just ask that for more questions about the process, because the TOEFL is only a part of the process, we ask that you please join us on at our centers, visit our charlas, um, whatever it is that you want more information about, please feel free to write to us. Um, on the website and right in front of you, you have my email. And Alejandro will shortly be sharing with you our social media sites. And remember that we are on Facebook, we're on Twitter and YouTube, and now Instagram. So if you have questions, Education USA Advisors, we have to have those answers. So thank you again, everybody, um, especially to you, Lucas. Muchísimas gracias por tu tiempo. And um, I'm sure that many of you will contact Lucas and look up Magush, um, just so that you know most of our students that come to the center um, are looking to improve their scores and they have benefited immensely from Magoosh on both their apps. Many of them have actually used the TOEFL program, but also from the different um, great articles that appear on the TOEFL blog of Magoosh. So again, all of those links are in the chat box and you can look through them at your leisure. Um, thank you so much and good night to everybody. Good night, Lucas and good night to you all.